John Bunyan, who went to jail for preaching God's word. David Livingstone brought the gospel to great unexplored lands. Mary Jones, a teenager whose example helped start the first Bible society. William Wilberforce, the man who wouldn't rest until slavery was defeated. John, do you want me to read some more? No, thanks. It sounds far too religious for me. Well, then I'll only read a little while longer, Mary says. John works as a tinker. A tinker mends the holes of pots and pans. John travels with his tinker's wagon, going from village to village. Tinkers were often pretty rough guys. John is no exception. He is notorious for his bad language. She doesn't mind that they are poor, but it bothers her that John shows no interest in God. Sunday afternoon, the whole village gathers to play games. But those sports are different than the ones we have today. One of them is cat clubbing. A barrel dangles from a rope with a cat trapped inside. Men take turns beating the barrel. Whoever splits the barrel, so the scared cat jumps out, wins. Come on, John, it's your turn. One good hit should do it. Wait, uh, I can't. John turns very pale and gazes off into the distance. Come on, what's the matter? Uh, I can't, I quit. John had heard something, but he wasn't sure what it was. Then John hears a voice saying, are you willing to let go of those bad things and be saved? Or would you rather hold on to them and be, and lost, be lost forever? forever? Is this really God trying to get through to him? From then on, John listens very carefully when Mary reads. He wants to know God, but no matter how hard he tries, he keeps on behaving the same old way. One day, John was at work and overheard some women talking. I used to think that God would never be pleased with me. I never understood it either. But as soon as I heard that preacher explain it, I felt like a new person. John strained to listen. You feel like new. You are a new person, one says. If you believe in Jesus and in everything he has done for you, you really are born again. Born again? That's it, John thinks. God lets you be born again. From then on, you are God's child. God forgives past sins and makes you new inside. Now, finally, John understands. John wants to know all he can about the Bible. Sometimes, he is even asked to preach in small independent churches. About this time, the King of England, Charles II, wants the Church of England to be the only church in his realm. Some resist and form the secret independent churches. John knows he will be in danger if he is caught preaching in their services. November 12, 1660. While John preaches in a barn, the meeting is interrupted. Quiet, people, quiet. This is a forbidden church service. In the name of King Charles II, I order you to leave at once. If we find you again in services like this, you could go to jail, so go home. As for your preacher, you're under arrest. John is put in jail and later brought before the judge. John Bunyan, I sentence you to three months in jail after which you will be released if you promise not to preach again. I can never promise that. John's wife and children visit him in jail. We miss you so much, John, but our friends haven't deserted us. We have enough food, but it is so hard without you. Their oldest daughter, now 11, is blind and very sick. John is very concerned about her well-being. 
It hurts me so much that I can't care for my family and preach God's Word. But now that I know how to write, I will write about the Lord so that others may hear. John's prison sentence is stretched from months to years. Occasionally, a friendly guard lets him out at night for a little while because he knows John will return. Sometimes, John even gets to preach. But tonight, John stays in his cell. Officials are coming from London to investigate reports of how Bunyan can still be preaching in secret. All they find is John sound asleep. In 1672, after 12 years in prison, John is released. What do you think he does? He immediately goes back to preaching. Three years later, he is arrested again and put in jail for his preaching. During his first 12 years in prison, John wrote some 60 books. The second time in jail, he wrote what would become one of the most famous books in all the world, The Pilgrim's Progress. This shows what the Bible teaches about our journey through life and how to get to heaven. It tells a story about a man weighed down with the heavy load of his sins on his back. How can he get rid of that load and find the way to eternal life? One day, he meets a man called Evangelist. Do you see that gate in the distance, he asks? Knock on that door. Behind it lies the way to eternal life. After many adventures, the pilgrim reaches the gate. Once behind it, he finds the cross where Jesus died. There, his heavy burden of sin falls off. But the road after that is not smooth either. One time, the pilgrim and his friend, Mr. Hope, are taken prisoner by a giant called Despair and are locked up in the Castle of Doubt. John describes very well how his characters feel. He himself has been in prison over 12 years and has known despair in the past. But now he has found Jesus as the way to peace with God. So John writes from his own experiences in the Pilgrim's Progress. It has become a world famous book, after the Bible one of the most circulated books in all the world. Even though The Pilgrim's Progress was written hundreds of years ago, it is still in almost every library in the world. You can easily get a copy and find out for yourself why John Bunyan's book, From Jail, has been loved by so many children around the world. The place is Scotland. It is the 1830s. In a small, dark attic, young David Livingstone studies hard to become a doctor. He wants to use his life and medical training to serve God. He prays, Oh God, please show me the way I should go. I will do whatever you ask of me. David believes God would have him be a missionary, so he goes to missionary training college. There he meets Mr. Moffat, an older missionary visiting from Africa. David Livingstone, he says, in Africa I have seen the smoke rise from the hill of a thousand villages that have not heard the gospel. There is an enormous work there for a doctor and missionary like yourself. If you think I am the man you're looking for, Mr. Moffat, I'm prepared to go with you to Africa, David says. So Mr. Moffat and David Livingstone arrive in Africa in 1841. They take an ox cart from the coastal port of Elizabeth to the village of Kuruman. It will take about 10 weeks because there are no roads. But this journey will not be the hardest that David will face. He will go on to travel through thousands of miles of African wilderness, often facing death-defying dangers. Help! Shoot, Mabawe, shoot! A lion attacks David, 
Mabawe, David's young helper, tries to shoot, but his rifle misfires. The lion throws David to the ground. The sharp teeth of the lion sink into his left shoulder. But then suddenly, the lion falls down. The gun worked after all. David has a broken arm and some other wounds that will afflict him for the rest of his life. David travels again by ox cart. Now he has a wife and a son. His wife is Mary Moffat, the daughter of the missionary who brought David to Africa. He is looking for a place to build a new mission post deeper inside the unexplored regions of Africa. Daddy, is that an elephant? Yes, Robert, but don't be afraid. They won't hurt us. Mary helps David in so many ways. The villagers call her the queen of the wagon as she travels on many of David's journeys. But after 11 years, when David decides to explore a shorter route to mid-Africa, not from the south, but from the coast, he sends his family back to England for safety. For two years, Livingstone travels. As he continues north, the difficulties increase. Because the jungle is so thick, all luggage must be carried. He must also travel through areas where tribes are at war with each other. One day, he reaches the Zambezi River. The river runs to the east. David must go west. He is trying to reach the Atlantic Ocean, so he looks for another way. Along his explorations, David brings the gospel message to the people, telling the story of Jesus. He gets along with most of the tribal chiefs, so he is able to show villagers Bible stories by what they call the magic lantern. This lantern eventually became what we call a slide projector. The picture is projected on a large white sheet hung between trees. Several chiefs become believers as a result of hearing the gospel. In 1853, Livingstone reaches Luanda at the coast, totally exhausted. As soon as he recovers, he journeys back to the east coast through the heart of Africa. Halfway there, Livingstone hears a thunderous sound for several days. When he reaches the Zambesi River, he discovers what the natives call the falls. The roaring water is one of the most spectacular sights in all the world. He is the first Westerner to ever see this amazing sight. He names his discovery after the English Queen, Victoria Falls. David returns to England as a hero. And while there, he often speaks to the Geographical Society, who are very interested in his experiences and plans. I hope to raise money through the sale of a book about my expeditions to buy a suitable boat to take back to Africa. After that, I also hope to track down the slave traders in Africa. Slave traders raided villages. They set fire to everything. They captured men, women, and children. They were loaded on ships. They were tied together with ropes and were beaten and driven as if they were animals. I want to do all I can, my friends, Livingstone said, to end this horrible situation. The members of the prestigious Geographical Society nod in agreement. They hoped that Livingstone would find the answer to the great mystery of where the Nile River begins. So David returns to Africa, now as the official English consul for inland Africa. But don't think everything was smooth sailing from then on. It wasn't. Go on, keep walking, you lazy pigs. Livingstone meets many slave convoys. One time he is able to free 80 slaves without any use of force. But another time he witnesses a bloodbath in which 1,500 people died. This is his fourth journey through Africa, and Livingstone continues to make important discoveries, 
including several big lakes like the Tanganyika. He finally reaches the settlement of Ujiji. David wrote some 42 letters to England, but none of them got there. In five years' time, he didn't have any contact with the outside world. His companions were the freed slaves of Africa. They saved his life many times and carried him on their backs sometimes for days on end. They take care of Livingstone as he lies sick in his hut. One day, Susie, one of Livingstone's helpers, comes running to his hut. Master, master, a strange white man is here. Something special must have happened. A procession arrives from Ujiji. A strong black man walks in front with the American flag. From the group, a man with his hand stretched out walks towards Livingstone. Dr. Livingstone, I presume? Yes, yes I am, the bewildered Livingstone says. I thank God that I have found you.